Picture this, you've done the damn thing. Made it through life, struggled, toiled, cried, loved and lost countless times over. All this culminating in that fateful and terminal diagnosis or that tragic accident you will never truly recover from. You make it to the end and after all the hooting and hollering, you finally get put in the ground. Now, three years pass, the grass above ground has long gotten a chance to regrow and fill in your humble burial plot. And after all the new batches of flowers have wilted and you finally made your peace with this new reality, you hear this sound. Soon enough, light, which you've been wholly unacquainted with for all those three years, begins to pierce through your decorative wooden resting box as its pride open to reveal the ghastly sight of your not so fully decomposed body. Your bones draped over with that fine tuxedo or that lovely dress your family chose to lay you to rest in. You think it's over when one of the strapping young lads who unboxed your remains peers down at you, uncertain, perhaps a bit queasy, only to be stunned when he begins collecting your bones piece by piece in yet another box. This one fitting to store a standard size 10 shoe. You want to say something to put a stop to this, but of course you can't because, well, you're dead. All the while your family stands, weeping at the foot of your grave, reliving the trauma of losing you and now suffering a whole new round of emotional damage. You might think this gruesome little scenario I've just concocted for your entertainment is just that, a sick reading of my darkest inner thoughts. But you'd be wrong. This is what it's like for just about everyone living in Greece today. And if you're not careful, it may soon enough come to a country near you. In Greece, it has long been law that after someone's been buried for three years, their body is exhumed or dug up and removed to make space available for someone else. Yeah, I'm not kidding. And though they're currently the most extreme in this legal standard, Greece is not alone in their flawed attempt to address this problem of death and what to do with bodies after the fact. In this slightly different Halloween themed video, I'll give you the backstory of this insane practice a quick flashback into the burial practices throughout history and discuss where we are now as we too quite literally run out of space to bury people in the US. But before we get into it, this video is sponsored by no one. <laughs> Imagine, wait, who would have been a great sponsor for this video? Let me know who you think in the comments. As far back as 60,000 BC, there's evidence early humans and Neanderthals decorated the deceased with flowers, antlers, and other items from the natural world. The pyramids of Egypt were built to house pharaohs and their consorts to help them journey through the afterlife in luxury and comfort, as were the pyramids built by the Mesoamericans. The medieval Songhai Empire in West Africa quickly buried most of their dead, reserving a tomb like that of Emperor Askia Mohammed I for someone with more cultural cachet. The Dogen people of Mali adopted the practice of using caves and cliff dwellings as burial chambers from the indigenous Telam people. The Taj Mahal in India was built by Emperor Shah Jahan of the Mughal Empire to house the tomb of his favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal, and later his own. The terracotta warriors of China were sculpted to reflect 8,000 warriors who would protect the first Qing emperor, Qing Shi Huang, in the afterlife. The Roman catacombs were built to house the remains of mostly Christians and Jews who were being persecuted by the Romans at the time for being monotheistic. The ancient Greeks were more inclined to cremate and store their dead in clay urns, while their successors, the Romans, also established columbaria as a way to enshrine multiple cremated remains and personal belongings. But if you lived and died two centuries ago in the US, you would have been washed and dressed by the women of the family and placed in a bed surrounded by candles to mask the scent of decomposition. Speaking of candles, I realized that the candle over here is supposed to be lit. Look at that. Beautiful. This gave time for other family and friends to visit over the next week to pay their respects. Now, as an aside, the limitations here could vary a lot, especially depending on your status as a free or enslaved person. That's a whole bigger issue that I'd need a whole other video to do justice to, but the video up top is a good start. But let's just say enslaved folks didn't get time off to mourn their dead and would often have to quickly bury their dead in unmarked graves. For the sake of this video though, let's assume you were not being held in bondage in this made up scenario where you lived 200 years ago. Before your body's putrefaction advanced too far, a local carpenter or just a man with some know-how would make a simple pine casket, 
and everyone would gather at the local cemetery or your backyard if you were lucky enough to be a landowner for a few words before returning you to the earth. You would be interred without any preservative chemicals, without being cosmetized with touch-ups like skin dyes, mouth formers, or eye caps. No headstone, flowers, or any of the other items we relate to a modern funeral. In essence, your demise would be respectful, but without pomp. During the Civil War, decomposing remains were strewn all over the South where battles were fought or rolled into mass graves. Only wealthy families were able to afford to pay to have bodies of deceased soldiers returned home. But before preservation methods became popularized in the US, the return journey from the battlegrounds in the South back to the Northern states left soldiers' bodies a mess in just a couple days. In 1840, the book History of Embalming was translated to English from its original French and quickly revolutionized the way Americans cared for their dead. The book detailed the practice of embalming, which ancient Egyptians are well known for originating 5,000 years earlier. For reference, the Egyptians would remove all the internal organs and drain the blood from a corpse, then fill the now empty body cavity with organic materials like linen, herbs, sawdust, sand, and incense, all to maintain the body's shape and to add a more pleasant scent to the mummy-to-be. Now, if there's one thing Americans will do, it's find a way to make a profit out of anything. So you know they were not gonna let these new advances in death care, detailed in a translated history of embalming, to go unexploited. Catching wind of these medical advances, opportunistic Americans began performing rudimentary embalmings on the corpse of Northern soldiers to preserve them for the train ride home. The most common technique involved replacing the body's blood with arsenic and mercury. But it would take then-President Abraham Lincoln to bring the practice into the mainstream. Lincoln commissioned the embalming of his 11-year-old son, Willie, who died in 1862 from thyroid fever. Then, when Lincoln was assassinated three years later, the same doctor embalmed the president's corpse, which would then be paraded via train for three weeks from Washington, D.C., almost 800 miles to Springfield, Illinois, where he would eventually be buried. Lincoln's casket was removed from the train at major stops for official ceremonies where it would be met with large crowds. This was the first time something like this had ever happened to a U.S. president. The crowds marveled at how human-like Lincoln's remains had appeared. Never before had they seen an embalmed body close enough to reach out and touch. And, well, the rest was quite literally history. Death quickly became professionalized, taking the responsibility and control out of the hands of Americans and placing it into the hands of the undertaker, or as they're better known today, the funeral director. As this industrialization of death care unfolded, the associated costs skyrocketed. The modern cemetery that looks like this one and this one, each with hundreds of acres of perfectly manicured grass, artificially maintained with toxic pesticides and fertilizers, began as many of our problems do today, with a businessman. This genre of cemeteries, which tends to resemble a golf course or sprawling suburban lawns, was designed by Hubert Eaton in 1917 to do just that, to wash away any trace of what burials in the US had been up to that point. With his new memorial park, Eaton stripped away much of what the new generation during his time found distressing or depressing with the 19th century stone cemeteries. Eaton was the founder of the famous Forest Lawn Memorial Parks that would come to litter across the greater Los Angeles area today. He envisioned Forest Lawn as a new third space for the living. With sweeping lawns and noble architecture, these spaces were meant to uplift their community rather than being a place of sorrow. It would become a place you could take a walk with your dog or read a book or to have a jog or I don't know, have a cookout, I guess. A valiant effort, as it may have been, we're now left with an environmental and practical crisis that a global industry worth $20 billion in the US alone is reluctant to address. The unfolding of the COVID-19 pandemic shook up a lot of the ways we go about life. And even more pertinent to this video, it shortened the proximity many of us had to death. Death became ubiquitous, and consequentially, so did the GoFundMe funeral. Today, you can easily spend $10,000, $20,000 on a funeral. And considering 74% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, 
and most can't afford a $1,000 emergency, there is no wonder why so many people are running to crowdfunding platforms like GoFundMe for assistance. More than 125,000 memorial fundraisers are created on the site every year. And while the instinct for some might be to point the finger at the everyday person struggling to make ends meet, I'll point mine at the industry making a killing off of the pain of a widow, or kids dumbstruck by the death of a parent, or parents overwhelmed by the death of a child. Can you imagine upselling a mom who lost her daughter trying to convince her that she needs to buy the most expensive casket because it's a symbol of her love? That's some sick shit, man. And what are you supposed to do when these unaffordable expenses meet? The Greece problem. You see, cemeteries in Greece cities, like many cities around the world, are overcrowded with no space to expand. But what makes Greece special is their solution to this problem. After being buried, bodies are only kept in the ground for three years. After that, families are forced to watch the exhumation of the body of their loved ones. From there, they must pay to rent a space in an ossuary, where the remains are kept in the style of a filing cabinet. If relatives don't show up for an exhumation or stop paying rent at the ossuary, the bones are thrown into something called the digestive pit, a vast underground mass grave. Now, if you're someone with a working brain, you would have probably realized by now just how little sense this approach makes, especially in a country squeezed by economic turmoil like Greece. Enter the Greek Orthodox Church, which believes that the body must be buried as a whole to make resurrection possible during the second coming of Jesus Christ. Apparently, many leaders of the church still reject the idea that bones left in the ground will eventually decompose and turn to dust, just the same as being cremated. And because priests aren't present when bodies are being dug up, like they are during the ceremony when bodies are being buried, some priests even refuse to believe that bodies are being dug up after three years at all. The most obvious issue at hand here is space. For instance, in Japan, virtually everyone is cremated, both for cultural reasons and as a way of preserving precious and finite land for the living. Back over here in the States, experts say that we'll likely run out of space to bury millennials and the younger generations in our biggest cities. In addition to embalmed human remains, a conventional American burial puts the equivalent of about 4 million acres worth of wood, 1.6 million tons of reinforced concrete, and 800,000 gallons of formaldehyde into the earth each year. But not too much on conventional burials now, because cremation, which is now chosen by 60% of Americans, generates 535 pounds of carbon dioxide per person. And while I won't be getting on here lecturing anyone about a carbon footprint, I do think it's worth acknowledging that the way we've been doing death isn't without its problems. Other alternatives include aquamation or water cremation, where a body is submerged in an alkali solution, heated and pressurized to cause the body to shed everything leaving only your bones and any surgically implanted metal supports behind. But this method uses 300 gallons of water per body and wouldn't be a significant enough replacement for cremation. And then there's the choice of a green burial, which ranges from simply wrapping the deceased in an organic cotton shroud before lowering them into the ground to a burial in a conservation park like Green Acres in Washington, where families can choose to root a variety of plants, flowers, and shrubs on a grave. Similar to this, there's also the tree pod burial method. You basically get turned into an egg that helps to grow a tree. There are over 150 green cemeteries in the US and Canada, but with nearly 54% of Americans now considering a green burial, it's clear we're gonna need a lot more of them. And what's so great about these green burials is the part of the process where you plant a tree, both to commemorate someone you've lost while allowing their remains to actually return to the earth and give way for the creation of new life. I don't know about you, but this feels a lot more natural than pumping Johnny full of cancer juice, locking him in a chunk of wood, sealing him in concrete, then burying him six feet under. Well, actually turns out graves aren't even six feet deep and haven't been that way for a while. They're actually about four feet deep, but you get the idea. Interment, or the practice of burials, is historically too significant to say flippantly, let's just get rid of it wholesale. But the way we do it now is evidently not sustainable, especially not in the US, or Greece for that matter. 
It's really difficult to say for sure, but I'm all for the method of planting a tree to mark the dead and preserving that land that would otherwise be an industrialized cemetery as a national preserve. It feels right and perfectly respectful, cheaper, and would be a way better use of our money. Obviously, all these methods that I've suggested now might not work perfectly for every single country. For instance, it might make sense for smaller countries like Japan to keep cremating most of their dead because for one, it's culturally significant to them, but also two, because of how small the country is, it might not make sense to have a whole swath of green cemeteries popping up all over the place. But in a country the size of the US with so much empty land outside of the big cities, it just might make sense to have more green cemeteries that become preserves that help repopulate the empty land with trees. Trees that we probably cut down to make the big cities in the first place. But let me know what you think. And if you've made it this far, give yourself a pat on the back <laughs> and consider sticking around. Make sure to give this video a like and share it to the other weirdos who would equally enjoy something like this as much as we did. Also, let me know what other kinds of topics you'd like to see me break down. Until next time, over and out.